well, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, today's presentation is Explore the Solar System with NASA. Amanda Thompson, a NASA ambassador, will discuss recent discoveries from two of NASA's biggest missions, the Perseverance, uh, which deals with Mars, and the New Horizons spacecraft that deals with Pluto. Uh, I had promoted the Curiosity rover, but uh, Amanda mentioned to me that like in a week or so, uh, NASA is going to be launching the uh, Perseverance rover. So uh, she's going to be touching uh, more on that uh, this morning. Uh, Amanda will also talk about the challenges of venturing into deep space and the successes we've been able to celebrate in this popular multimedia presentation. And Amanda Thompson is a part of the Solar System Ambassador Program through NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And she's also a high school earth science teacher and a lover of all things space. And um, now more than ever, I have an appreciation for our teachers. So thank you, Amanda, for what you do during your day job. And, uh, you know, really looking forward to this presentation. You can take it away. Thanks so much. All right. Um, hi, guys. I'm going to go ahead and start off by sharing the screen uh, and just uh, go into my presentation. And I'll kind of be talking in the background as well. Um, here we go. All right, so, um, oh dear, audio device. Can you guys still hear me okay? Okay, good. Uh, so, um, I uh, am going to be focusing specifically on Mars and Pluto today, not to say that they are in any way the most important objects in the solar system, but there's a lot of cool stuff that's happened in the last few years. Um, just to reiterate a couple of quick things, uh, just please have your microphone muted. Uh, I've seen in the pictures that we've got a variety of ages here, which is awesome. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have uh, a bunch of people who love space, no matter how old or young you are. Um, so I'm going to sometimes veer towards more general analogies, but I'm also going to be available to talk about things on a higher level as well. Uh, and just to keep things moving, there's going to be one Q&A session at the end. So the good news is uh, I can't see you right now. So if you're a kid and you need to get up and wiggle around, that's totally fine. If you're an adult and you need to do the same thing, totally fine. Who's going to stop you from, you know, doing whatever you need to do? And, and you can just kind of have me in the background. Um, and then at the very end, I'll open it up for questions on both Mars and Pluto. So uh, he already mentioned that I am a solar system ambassador. Uh, I'm a volunteer through NASA and the Jet Propulsion Lab. Um, and so our primary goal is to inform people about NASA missions, what's uh, happening, what their discoveries are, uh, and the purpose. So though there's been some very cool stuff going on with space uh, in other um, companies and, and countries, I'm going to keep my focus primarily on NASA today. Um, and of course, I'm also a high school earth science teacher. So um, let's start off by talking about what's at Mars right now. Uh, Mars is really, really difficult to get to. Um, in, in fact, there have only been, I believe, two countries at this point that have had successful missions to Mars, and that is um, uh, the United States and India. Um, and the failure rate for missions getting to landing on orbiting Mars is very, very high. Um, in some parts, because it's, it's far away, uh, the shortest trip right now we can get to Mars with our current technology is about six to eight months. So uh, it's a long time for a spacecraft to be out there. But the things that we have currently operating either on the surface or in orbit are the Curiosity rover, which is now at 2,380 days on Mars, uh, the InSight lander, which has been there for um, almost two years, a uh, three orbiters, which have different uh, responsibilities. There's the Odyssey orbiter, uh, which does a lot of communication with the ground, sat, uh, the ground rovers back to Earth. Uh, MRO, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and MAVEN. Um, and so we've got things currently working on Mars, doing science on Mars, sending back data, pictures. A lot of the orbiters are really useful for helping us pick future landing sites. So um, the current missions we have are very, very valuable. 
and very much alive. Uh, I want to focus on this timeline for just a second. Um, it says follow the water and then as you go through the timeline, habitable environments, seeking signs of life and the future. Um, at this point, we can say very, very confidently, there was once water on Mars. It used to be a much warmer planet, it used to be a much wetter planet. And so things like curiosity uh, are in this habitable environment phase. They were looking for places that could have supported life. The cool thing about um, right here, the 2020 Science Rover is actually an older name for the rover that is launching this week. Um, <clears throat> the Perseverance rover is looking for actual evidence of life. Uh, not habitable conditions, but actual evidence of life. Uh, and it launches on July 30th, um, which is so soon and so exciting. I can't wait to see the launch. If you're interested in seeing the launch yourself, uh, NASA is very good about live streaming. Um, if you go to the NASA YouTube channel, they will certainly have a live stream where you can catch the launch. Um, I do want to point out that the launch window, the period of time we can try to launch Perseverance is July 30th to August 15th. Now let's say you have a really rainy, stormy day in, uh, in Florida. This is launching from Cape Canaveral. You don't want to launch on a terrible thunderstorm, windy day. So there's a window of time that we can launch the rover. And it's only about two weeks. And believe it or not, if we miss that two-week window of time, we have to pack up the Perseverance rover, put it away, and we can't try to launch it again for about two years. Because the way that oh, the way that Mars and Earth are uh, aligned in space, because they both orbit the sun at different speeds, Earth is closer and Mars is farther away. So every once in a while, every two years, we um, sort of catch up, Earth catches up to Mars in a way that we can launch a craft at the lowest amount of fuel, which is important because fuel is expensive and it's heavy. Uh, and with also the shortest amount of time. So that's that maybe six month, eight month travel. Um, so we really hope we hit somewhere in that two week window. Otherwise, we're going to have to wait. Uh, and putting Perseverance away for a while would be unfortunate. But a two week window with the fickle Florida weather uh, is probably going to work out just fine. So uh, keep an eye on July 30th if that doesn't work. Keep checking back for a new launch date. Um, and then it's going to travel from Earth to Mars and be landing on February 18th, 2021. So what is exactly, uh, where is Perseverance going to go is one thing we should talk about. So this color-coded map of Mars, obviously Mars is not rainbow colors, although that would be fantastic. Uh, these colors tell you how high or low the elevation is. So blue shows you areas that are really low. This right here is uh, called the Hellas Basin, this dark blue circle here. It's the lowest place on Mars because it's a huge impact crater. Something enormous came and hit Mars uh, about four and a half billion years ago. And then the whole northern part of the planet is pretty low in elevation. It's this light blue area. It's also really smooth because it's very likely it was covered in water uh, more recently than the uh, parts here that are orange and yellow and green that have more craters, which suggests that they are older and also are higher elevation. And so Perseverance is going to land in this area right here, which is called the Acidus Planitia. And we're aiming for this tiny crater right here called Jezero. And why do we care about Jezero? Well, this is a zoom in picture of Jezero Crater. Um, this yellow circle in the picture is actually showing you where we're gonna try to land the spacecraft. And we wanna look for evidence of life. And there is ample evidence that this crater has had a lot of water into it. So I want you guys to notice this sort of snaking area on the left of the picture. And think about the last time you saw a river with curves and bends. These are called meanders right here. Um, this 
is evidence that a river flowed into this crater. And if you look right here, there's this, it's a little hard to tell in this picture, but it's sort of a fan shape, kind of like those old fashioned fans where you can flip them open and fan yourself very nicely. Um, this delta forms when river water, moving water, hits water that's standing still and it drops everything that was in, all the dirt, all the sediment, all the stuff. It drops it in this really nice fan shape. So this is big evidence that Jezero Crater used to have water in it. Turns out that uh, there's another uh, river up in this part of the crater on the northern section that also flowed into the crater. So there was lots of water coming in and it actually filled up to a point, uh, I'll, come back, I'll come back to this in a second. Uh, it actually filled up to a point that the, uh, the crater overflowed and then flowed out the other side. Uh, so it was, uh, it was a lake with two rivers feeding it water and then water would flow out the other side in another river. Um, so if anyone knows Lake Winnipesaukee, for example, uh, in New Hampshire, Lake Winnipesaukee has um, only one inlet stream, so one where the water's coming in and one where the water's going out. And so Jezero Crater is like a really large Martian Lake Winnipesaukee in some ways. So just I wanted to show you for a minute the delta piece again. Uh, here's the Jezero Crater Delta on the right. And it's that fan shape. You can see that a very similar structure happens uh, in rivers like the Mississippi. That when water hits, when moving water hits still water like the ocean or a lake, drops everything and it makes this weird fan shaped deposit with a bunch of little streams coming off the side. And so that happens on Mars as well as Earth. Now, what we're looking for, remember, with Perseverance is what we want to know is we want to find evidence of life. And so we need to look at the water. We know there's water here, so there could potentially have been life here. We're looking at clay and carbonates. And you can see in this picture here that it mar uh, marks some things called marginal carbonates. That doesn't mean marginal, like they're really small or like they're just sort of some carbonates because sometimes marginal means, yeah, there's some. This means it's on the margin of the lake. There's actually a, a string of carbonates here that um, they're referring to as like a bathtub ring. If, uh, if you know when you get out of the bathtub after it'll say, um, you've had Epsom salts in there or something. It leaves a little you know, scum around the edge. Uh, when this lake was in Jezero Crater, it actually deposited a bunch of carbonates along the margins or the outside of the lake. And then we find some carbonates on the floor too. Things about these minerals that we're finding, clay and carbonate, that we've actually been able to take pictures from space from the orbiters at Mars to see where this stuff is. Maybe there are fossils in these minerals. That would be uh, incredible. Uh, or some other evidence of life. So these, uh, these minerals, especially carbonates, are really, really good things to look for when you want to find life. So carbonates on Earth, uh, we have them everywhere. We have them in the form of shells. We have them in coral. Whenever carbon dioxide interacts with water, uh, you get carbonates. And I wanna talk about this weird lumpy looking stuff down on the bottom of my slide here. These are some of the oldest fossils of life on Earth, and they are called stromatolites. And they are, I find that if I try to explain it to you without kind of visual evidence, it's going to be tricky to explain. So I found a great video that talks a little bit about what exactly a stromatolite is and how these lumpy rocks relate to life. So I'm going to try playing this video and see if it, uh, if it tells you, and I'm going to unplug my headset while I do this so that you guys can hear the sound. What is the oldest thing you've ever seen? The Egyptian pyramids that are 4,600 years old? A dinosaur fossil that is 230 million years old? 
How about a stromatolite fossil that is 3.7 billion years old? What is a stromatolite? Stromatolites are layered rock-like structures made by the activities of microbes. To see living examples of the world's most ancient ecosystem, look no further than Shark Bay in Western Australia. Why should you care about stromatolites? Well, one of the most prevalent microbes in living stromatolites are cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria are microbes that feed off the sun using a metabolism called photosynthesis, just like plants. One of the most important characteristics of cyanobacteria is they provide much of the oxygen we breathe. Because of these cyanobacteria, stromatolites have played an important role in creating the oxygen-rich atmosphere we have today. Also, stromatolites grow towards the sun, just as plants do. When you see the insides of a stromatolite, there can be thousands of individual layers, each layer building on top of the other. So the newest, youngest layer is always on the surface, with the microbes searching for the sun. So what are we going to do if these amazing stromatolite ecosystems ever die out? It's an important question, as living stromatolites are highly susceptible to climate change and rising sea levels. Not only do these amazing ecosystems help generate the oxygen in our atmosphere, but also living stromatolites represent an important window into the ancient Earth. Studying stromatolites helps us understand how life is adapted and evolved to the ever-changing Earth. Knowing more about our past helps guide us to understand and respond to present and future environmental issues. So if you're ever in Western Australia, be sure to stop by and gaze at these magnificent ecosystems. All right. So if you'll just give me a minute to get back into full screen. Um, one of the things that um, NASA talks about when they're looking at Jezero Crater is the potential of finding these stromatolites. Just like on Earth, they're ancient, ancient uh, structures. They can, um, they can record evidence of climate change. We know that Mars had a wet atmosphere. And so is it possible, and then it started to dry up over time. So is it possible we can see this climate change uh, collected in the rocks uh, around Jezero Crater? And the answer is, we hope so. Um, and so these are, uh, these are some of those biological life bearing signals we're looking for when we go to Jezero. Now, perseverance is very similar in many ways to curiosity. Uh, for example, their design is incredibly similar in large part because um, here on the right, Mars 2020, that's the Perseverance rover, it actually uses some of the parts that they didn't need, some of the extra spare parts that they didn't use for MSL, which is another name for the Curiosity rover. So they actually were able to save some money, uh, which I find people want to know about when they're talking about space missions is where's, where's the money coming from? Where's it going? Uh, they were actually able to, uh, to use some heritage components. And so Perseverance does look a lot like Curiosity. Uh, they have made some driving improvements. On the left, you can see this wheel from Curiosity after about 1,600 days of driving. Um, and so this wheel is torn to bits because of sharp rocks on the surface, because of, um, I'm sorry, my cat has come to visit me. <laughs> He's part of the show now. Um, Curiosity uh, had wheels that were um, made of pretty thin aluminum and so they've uh, they've upgraded the wheels on Perseverance so that they now have uh, thicker aluminum and bigger treads. So even though we're using some of the same components, we have made some improvements based on what we've learned from Curiosity. We also know from past Mars missions that dust on Mars is a real problem. So we cannot use solar panels like we used to. This right here is just a time lapse of a Martian dust storm in 2018. This is the one that took out the uh, Opportunity rover. Um, but we have uh, Perseverance will be powered by the same thing that powers um, Curiosity and that's what's called an MMRTG, which is essentially saying it's got nuclear power on board. It has something about the size of a jumbo marshmallow, 
completely made of plutonium-238, and the heat given off by that plutonium will decay over time and provide the electrical power for the rover itself. So remember that Perseverance and Curiosity are both powered by nuclear marshmallows. That is how I like to think about it. And uh, that's essentially a short version on how radioisotope thermal generators work. Um, the landing system is uh, similar to Curiosity. Um, in the past, we used to bounce our spacecraft onto Mars because it was cheap and easy and uh, the spacecraft were pretty small. But Curiosity and Perseverance were both uh, about the size of an SUV, so we can't really bounce them and not expect something to shake loose. So the Curiosity and Perseverance systems are using what's called the Sky Crane. And let me just give you an idea of what the Sky Crane technique looks like. Things are looking good. Coming up on the tree. Vehicle reports entry interface. I'll be getting to feel the atmosphere as we go in here. It is reporting that we are seeing G's on the order of uh, 11, 12 or That is the sky crane. Um, first, there's a parachute because Mars does have an atmosphere. It's just very, very thin. So uh, they use a parachute to slow it down. Then they use rockets to slow it down some more once they get close to the surface. And then they use a crane to lower it down and, and land it. Now, at the, once stuff is touched down, the sky crane actually detaches and flies off somewhere else. Uh, and so um, the, uh, the sky crane we found to be a pretty stable platform uh, for landing something pretty heavy and delicate on Mars. Uh, there are ways that perseverance will be different from curiosity. Um, when you are driving on another planet, uh, it, there is this idea of light time. So for example, uh, the sun is eight light minutes away, which means that if I want to wait for, if I wanted to look at the sun, well, oh, let me rephrase, never look at the sun, it's a terrible idea, but uh, the sunlight, if you were to go out and feel the sun on your skin, the light you are feeling came all the way from the sun and took eight minutes to travel to your arm. So the sun is eight light minutes away. Uh, it turns out Mars, because it moves in its own orbit, it's sometimes closer to us and sometimes further away. Uh, sometimes it is four light minutes away, and sometimes it's 24 light minutes away, which means that if you wanted to tell the rover to drive in a straight line, but then take a right at that rock, you can't just drive it like a video game and tell it to turn when you want it to. You have to plan ahead. Um, and so some of the drivers actually wear these very cool virtual reality goggles of looking around uh, at what's around them and they can actually use that to plan 
their path, but most, mostly the rover, everything you do has to be programmed in advance. Um, and so this, this particular rover is getting a little bit more uh, independence. It, if it sees an obstacle, it can make some last minute changes to go around. Um, but just to give you an idea of how exactly this rover programming works, remember, it's not instantaneous. I can't see a, a big hole in the ground and be like, uh-oh, we need to turn around. If, if they accidentally find a uh, really big hole, then they have to uh, hope for the best. So this is sort of giving the rover its own chance to, to change its driving. How do rovers drive on Mars? First of all, there's no joystick for driving a Mars rover. Before a rover hits the road, engineers send computer commands overnight, telling it where to go the next day. Depending on how tricky the terrain is, rover drivers have two options. They can send a string of specific commands like drive forward five meters, then turn right 90 degrees. The rover turns its wheels enough times to add up to five meters, and then turns in place. Or if it looks safe, they can let the rover think on its own. They write commands like, see that rock over there? Find your way there safely. Then using two cameras like human eyes, the rover gets a 3D view of hazards such as large rocks and steep slopes. After mapping the danger zones, it plots the safest route to avoid them. Either way, did the rover complete its drive as planned? Engineers double check when the rover sends back a postcard of its new spot on Mars. All right, so it's not so simple as driving in real time, um, but some other things that uh, we're putting on board the Perseverance rover is there's going to be a helicopter. Um, think about this in terms of size as like a drone that you see people flying out in open fields, things like that, but there will be a helicopter on board the rover that will be dropped off and will have its own mission, which is to figure out if we can actually fly something on another planet. Uh, the helicopter is called Ingenuity. It has to deal with an incredibly thin atmosphere. So those blades that you can see right here uh, have to rotate very, very, very fast, about 2,400 revolutions per minute. Um, and they're going in opposite directions. So it's actually faster revolutions per minute. It's spinning faster than a passenger helicopter does on Earth. Um, in terms of how that affects the lift, there's less air to lift the helicopter. So uh, they've done the best they can in testing to figure out recreating atmospheres that are about the same density, uh, are about as thick as, the, as Mars's atmosphere, but they're gonna be testing this little helicopter multiple different times. Uh, they plan to try four or five test flights but this is all assuming that number one, this little solar panel on top, because we talked about the risks of solar panels and how dusty Mars is. We hope this solar panel on top can get the helicopter enough power. Additionally, it gets down to about negative 130 degrees Fahrenheit at night here in Jezero Crater. So can the electronics on this teeny tiny helicopter survive the cold? Uh, so if they can survive those tests and hopefully get the four to five test flights, that's going to be pretty cool. Uh, we have never had a flying craft on another planet before uh, inside a planet's atmosphere. Uh, and I just wanted to mention that the name was submitted by Veniza Rupani. Uh, and then I also, I had written down, I forgot to mention this before, uh, the name for the uh, rover was submitted by Alex Mather. So both of these people are high school students who had the opportunity to write in uh, an essay contest saying why they thought uh, this would be a good name for the rover. And one of the things I found that was really fascinating about uh, Perseverance is at first people weren't on board with the name. They thought, okay, I mean, Perseverance is nice, but I mean, We've persevered on Mars for a long time. Um, but then they had to start doing a lot of the preparation in terms of assembling the spacecraft, putting the helicopter and the payload on board, putting together the rocket. And they had to do all of this while taking coronavirus um, precautions for the staff, 
Uh, a lot of meetings had to be done remotely when normally they'd, they'd all get their hands on different components and be able to troubleshoot in person. A lot of things have had to be uh, dealt with remotely that never had before. And so now Perseverance, the name, uh, a lot of NASA employees on this mission think that it's the perfect name. Uh, and Ingenuity is certainly a great name for a little helicopter trying to fly on another planet. <laughs> The last thing I want to talk about related to Perseverance and Mars is something incredibly cool called a uh, sample return. We have never returned samples from another object in space besides the moon. We certainly have Martian meteorites that hit the planet, but we've never brought back rock from another planet. Um, and so this rover is going to drill collect samples and put them in tubes, store them on the planet, and get another craft to pick them up in the future. Um, and so I thought this video explained that really well, but this would be incredible. We still work with mo moon rocks from over 50 years ago on the moon. We're still studying those moon rocks. So for us to have Martian rocks and to actually work with, this would be an incredible way to, to discover more about the solar system than we've ever known before. Hi, I'm Raquel Villanueva here at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Now, it has been a dream of scientists for generations to bring back samples from the surface of Mars. Now, right now, the Mars 2020 rover mission is laying the groundwork for that to happen. And that's why I'm in the in-situ instrument laboratory with Jessica Samuels. And she's here to tell us what's going on here. Well, we use this facility to develop and design our hardware and software systems for our Mars mission. And how does the sampling system work? So we have a drill on the end of our robotic arm. And as we are drilling the surface of Mars, we will be collecting pieces of Mars into the sample tube at that time. Mm -hmm. We'll then transfer that sample tube into the inside of the rover and then seal it for storage as we continue to explore the surface. After we've collected a diverse set of samples, we will drop them off onto the surface and then have them there for our future uh, sample return mission to continue. Well, I know you have some tests to keep doing and I'm actually gonna go check out the next phase at a different lab. We're in a testing lab affectionately known as the Sandbox, and I'm here with Austin Nicholas. Now, can you explain how we are going to bring back samples from Mars? So, uh, starting from uh, after 2020 has deposited tubes on the surface, there are two more missions to go in bringing the tubes back to Earth. The first is a lander mission. It carries three major elements, a sample fetch rover and a sample transfer arm that lets you transfer the samples from the fetch rover into the rocket, and a Mars ascent vehicle, which is a rocket that brings the samples from Mars into space. Meanwhile, the orbiter has also launched from Earth in 2026 and is making its way towards Mars, and it'll be in position by the time the rocket's fully loaded. The orbiter will then go to the sample container that the rocket's put into space and then capture it, ultimately bringing them to Earth in 2031. That sounds complicated. It is complicated, but fortunately we're not doing it alone. So we have a great partnership with the European Space Agency, and they're providing some major pieces of this mission. Within NASA, we've actually got a number of centers working on uh, all of the different pieces. So we're partnering with Marshall Space Flight Center for the Mars Ascent Vehicle, Langley and Ames for the Earth Entry Vehicle, Glenn for the sample fetch rover wheels, and we're partnering with Goddard for the orbiter payload. And so there's really a, it's a, it's a whole NASA effort to get more sample return done. Sounds like there is a lot of work to be done, but this all kicks off with the launch of Mars 2020 this summer in Cape Canaveral, Florida. And there's lots of excitement here as we get ready to make history. All right, sample return is a really big deal. Uh, obviously we're looking very much into the future. Uh, in 2031 is when they hope to get those samples back, but um, man, I can't wait to see if it works. Uh, I am going to shift gears a little bit, um, and I'm going to talk about Pluto and the New Horizons mission <clears throat> to kind of finish off the talk. Uh, Pluto New Horizons is an older mission that a lot of you may have heard of at this point, so I kind of wanted to give you a quick rundown of what it did discover, just in case you didn't. 
uh, hear about it at the time, uh, and also show you where it is today. Uh, in terms of what Pluto is, uh, I don't have time for a long, uh, mm, I find that the kids are like, yeah, Pluto's not a planet, and I find that the adults are like, what are you talking about? So I don't, I don't really have the time to, to argue about Pluto's planetary status today. Uh, but as much as I would love to, let's talk about what a Kuiper Belt object is, because it does have a lot to do with what Pluto is like compared to what it is, uh, what it is near in the solar system. So this is a view of our solar system. This is the orbit of Jupiter here. Um, Pluto is this yellow orbit, kind of tilted in relation to the rest of the solar system planets. Uh, and then there's this donut shape of very small icy objects um, that are all, Pluto's the largest of them, and Pluto is still smaller than some of Jupiter's moons. So Pluto is one of many tiny icy objects out pretty far from the sun that we think are leftovers from when the solar system was forming. And of course, planets form by taking smaller objects and sticking them together and making them bigger. Kind of like if you have a big pile of Play-Doh and you roll it all over, say, <laughs> this is a terrible analogy, but your dusty kitchen floor, well, it's gonna pick up a whole bunch more stuff and get bigger. Uh, and that process of getting bigger by sticking together is called accretion. So these are all the objects that didn't really get accreted by the bigger planets. Uh, and so these objects are the leftovers of what the very early solar system was like. So it was really important that we fly out there and check out Pluto, see what it's made of, learn about a uh, lot about our early solar system. But we only really had one shot at this. So New Horizons did a test run of all of its instruments at Jupiter. Uh, the spacecraft launched in 2006. And then when it got to Jupiter, about 16 months later, turned on all of its cameras. It uh, looked at Jupiter and this moon here is the same one that's on the left. This is Io. And what you could see with Io, one of those really large moons of Jupiter, this little plume coming off the top is a volcanic eruption because Io has sulfur volcanoes and it is constantly erupting because Jupiter is so large that it's actually squeezing the, the moon so much that it essentially causes it to volcanically erupt all the time. But the good news is Jupiter uh, at the flyby, our systems worked perfectly. And we used Jupiter for one more thing called a gravitational slingshot. So New Horizons was put onto a rocket flung into the solar system with as much power we could give it off of Earth, but that still wasn't enough to get it to, to Pluto um, in less than 13 years. And we wanted to shave some time off of that before Pluto started getting too much further from the sun in its orbit, because it has a squished orbit. Sometimes it's farther and sometimes it's closer. So we used the gravity of Jupiter to slingshot, uh, slingshot the spacecraft to give it a boost. So I want you guys to think about the last time you went ice skating, roller skating, and you were skating along and you grabbed the hand of the person behind you and you whip them forward. Uh, if you've ever seen roller derby, they do this move a lot. It's called the whip. Um, the planet essentially gave Pluto, or, sorry, gave New Horizons a whip uh, around itself, it used its gravity to shave three years off the mission time. So instead of taking 13 years to get to Pluto, this one path by Jupiter actually gave us a trip that was nine years. And uh, so we can actually, it doesn't always just take fuel to speed up a spacecraft. Sometimes you can play with physics, which is pretty fun. Um, now, this is the best picture we are capable of getting of Pluto from around Earth. This picture uh, is from the Hubble Space Telescope, which you guys, it sounds like in a program tomorrow, could learn a lot about the different things from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, but uh, this is the best we can do right now. If we 
resolve this image and show us what the best thing from New Horizons is, it's a much clearer picture. Um, so this is Pluto from up close and personal on the New Horizons spacecraft. As it flew by, New Horizons never landed um, and it just flew by for just about 12 minutes it was its closest approach and then it just kept going out into space. Uh, and so uh, we were only able to snap pictures of one side, but what we did see of Pluto is that uh, it's covered in mountains. Uh, this is not an actual video, this is a simulation based on what we actually got back from data from the spacecraft. We put that into a flying simulator and we're able to show you kind of what it would look like to fly over Pluto. We have mountains taller than the Rockies, but these mountains are made of ice. Uh, we have glaciers made of nitrogen and carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide ice. This orange and red stuff is methane ice, which reacts to sunlight and turns orange and pink. We found that Pluto has an atmosphere and it has fog as well. So it's a really cold place, but it, and really far from the sun, but it still has an atmosphere and perhaps even some weather as well. And one of the most important things we found is there is a ton of water ice on Pluto. So the higher the blue, uh, the more blue you see in this picture on the right and on the left, the more water ice you're looking at. Um, and so the water ice tells us that these objects in the far out solar system uh, have so much water ice in them that might explain where some of our early water came from um, on Earth and maybe on Mars is that these objects actually um, came from the Kuiper Belt. Things like comets are out here in the Kuiper Belt and they may have delivered some of this water ice to the surfaces of the inner planets. Uh, we discovered that there might be cryovolcanoes, which is to say volcanoes that erupt ice instead of lava. Seems counterintuitive, but very cool. Um, and we discovered that this whole system, we used to think Pluto had one moon, and it was Charon. Uh, it turns out it has five, but because Pluto and Charon are very similar in size, Charon's about half the size of Pluto, we discovered that because they're so close in size, Pluto and Charon actually orbit each other. They don't actually, it, Charon's not orbiting Pluto, they orbit like a kind of a space in between. And because of that weird balance of physics, it makes the other moons of Pluto, Nix, Styx, Kerberos, and Hydra, um, behave really, really strangely. Uh, so this is what the, <laughs> what the moons orbit like around Pluto. Uh, you can see the blue one is going uh, very fast. Um, the red one is actually going, I think it's the red one. No, the yellow one is going backwards. Uh, and so this whole system, we've never seen a planetary system with this kind of orbital and rotational dynamics before. So that's really, really strange. This is Charon up close and personal, uh, the largest moon of Pluto. You can see that it's got an area here cutting across the middle that looks like a ridge. It actually is possible evidence that this moon actually started out bigger and has shrunk a little bit and those are wrinkles from the shrinking. Uh, it also has this orange spot on top that is from uh, methane that has been sort of captured blowing off of Pluto. Uh, here's just a couple of close-ups of the other moons. We never really got close enough to the other moons of Pluto, <laughs> to the other moons of Pluto <laughs> to, uh, to get much better pictures than this. But uh, this is, uh, you know, four of the five. And we can see that they're not your traditional uh, spherical objects. Uh, the moons of Pluto, with the exception of Charon, tend to be kind of lumpy uh, and odd-shaped objects which is not super surprising because things out here in the Kuiper Belt, we think collide pretty frequently. Um, and that brings me to the last target of New Horizons.
uh, and that is something called Ericoth. This is Ericoth. It used to be called Ultima Tool, but it was renamed a few months ago in November. Um, I guess that was more than a few months ago, but time is relative now. Uh, it was renamed. It's a Powhatan and Algonquin word for sky. Um, and Ultima Tool are these two lumps. Uh, it almost looks like a peanut uh, of objects that stuck together. Kind of like if I go back for a moment, like uh, Kerberos and the Hydra that there are objects out here in this outer part of the solar system that can stick together. Uh, and sometimes they don't crash into each other and, and break apart. Sometimes in the case of Ultima and Tool, they, when they collided, it was so slow that they actually stuck together in a really gentle collision and made this bigger object. Um, so we are, this was uh, New Horizons last flyby. Uh, it flew past Arakoth on January 1st, 2019, uh, and now it is just continuing off into space forever. It's never coming home. Uh, I should tell people who, uh, who are worried about it, there are no people on board the New Horizons or Perseverance spacecraft, so it's okay that it's not coming home. Uh, New Horizons has about enough fuel on board. It's also nuclear powered with the radioactive isotopes to last until the, the 2030s. Uh, it's still looking at gas in between stars. It's looking at the solar wind and how much hydrogen gas actually is getting out here from the sun. And it's tracking and looking for other Kuiper Belt objects. But it doesn't seem to be on path for any of those in particular. So that is, uh, is what I have to say about Mars and Jupiter, or sorry, Mars and Pluto as of now. Uh, so if you guys have questions, I think, uh, Robert, you were saying the best way might be to put them in a chat or you could raise your hand and ask questions. I'm up for either thing. If you'll just give me one second. Great. And at this point, I'm going to stop the recording.